We're going to try not to make this about hazing, as I said, although hazing is going to come in a little, a little bit here and there. He was an amazing person with an incredible sense of humor. He was shy until he got to know you, and then he was larger than life. I was like, so wait a second, so you want to fly out on, on Sunday, the day after New Year's Eve, so January 1st, and you want to basically fly home on Tuesday. That doesn't give us a lot of time in California. It's going to be very expensive. And he said, yeah, I'd like to do that. Um, and he wasn't a kid that asked for very much, so I went along with it. It cost way more money than I would have liked to have spent, but it's the best money I ever spent because that was our last picture together as a family. Tim received a text message telling him to report to his fraternity house by 9.30 p.m. wearing khakis and a blazer. He was told not to be late and that they were going to get him fucked up. After finishing the handle, they were lined up behind the door, and one by one, they were allowed through the door where they encountered a drinking obstacle course. After all this happened, somebody brought Tim upstairs because they knew he was noticeably drunk. Um, and it was about 11 o'clock at night. Uh, problem is, they left him alone. During the course of the night, Tim came in and out of coherency. Uh, he walked around the house. He fell down a bunch more times. Um, and then he went back to the basement steps, and that's really the last time anything was seen of him in the video. Now, close your eyes and imagine that your brother's pledging a fraternity and it started last night. You get a call from your brother's roommate saying he didn't come home last night, and that's not like him. He always comes home. You decide something's wrong and call the hospital to see if he's there. They say, yes, there's been an accident. Come right away. Your dad says, this better not have anything to do with that fraternity. And your mom tells him it was the first night of pledging. Fortunate enough to have Jim and Evelyn Piazza here today. As most of you know, uh, they're the parents of Timothy Piazza, whose life was cut short due largely in part to an alcohol-fueled initiation ritual at the Beta Thai. Pi Fraternity House here on campus just two years ago on February 4th, 2017. And so they're here today and I'm, thank you so much for coming. Um, so let's give, them a, let's give them a welcome. Um, first, we just want to thank everybody for, uh, for coming to hear us today. Um, we normally make presentations throughout the country and normally they're about hazing. Um, but uh, when the professor asked us to, uh, to come here to talk about alcohol, I said, look, we're not alcohol experts, although we learned a lot more about it over the past two years than we would ever wish we knew. Um, but we felt compelled because it is Penn State and there is a special place for us here at Penn State and, and we want a great college experience for everybody. So we figured what the heck, we're gonna, we're gonna give this a try and, and see how we can do. Um, how many people here are seniors? <clears throat> so Tim would have been a senior and he would have graduated this year. Did anybody, anybody know Tim? Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to try not to make this about hazing, as I said, although hazing is going to come in a little, a little bit here and there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Tim, what happened to him, um, the effects of alcohol and the misuse of alcohol. And then some things that we're going to ask you to walk away with and, and, and hopefully do for us, do for yourself, do for your friends to keep things a little bit safer. So with that, I'll turn it over. Okay. So I just want to tell you a little bit about Tim and tell you the kind of person that he was. He was an amazing person with an incredible sense of humor. He was shy until he got to know you. And then he was larger than life. He was smart, athletic, loved Netflix and video games and he kind of had his life figured out. He was going to major in mechanical engineering so he could have a career designing prosthetics, go to grad school, marry his high school sweetheart eventually, and just have fun with his brother and friends. So this is a picture of us at the uh, Rose Bowl in January of 2017. Uh, for those of you that remember, the Rose Bowl was on January 2nd that year because it fell on a uh, January 1st fell on a Sunday, we competed with the NFL. January 2nd happened to be our anniversary as well. Anyway, when uh, Penn State beat Wisconsin in the Big Ten Championship game, Tim uh, texted us and said, hey, uh, I'd really like to go to the Rose Bowl. And I was like, all right, well, it'll be a lot of money, but we'll, you know, it's California, it'll be a good break, we'll go for a nice week vacation, you guys are on break. And he said, well, we can't really do that. Um, 
I said, well, why not? And he said, well, December 31st is New Year's Eve. I have to be with Caitlin. I need to spend time with her. Um, she's at another school. I can't leave her alone on New Year's Eve. And I said, uh, okay, I get that. So we'll just we'll pack on the time on the back end. And he said, well, I can't do that either. And I said, well, why not? And he said, because I have this internship, and they're going to need me back at work. And meanwhile, this kid's between his freshman and sophomore year. I don't know how much he really needed an intern. But he said, i, I got to be back by Wednesday. And I was like, so wait a second. So you want to fly out on, on Sunday, the day after New Year's Eve, so January 1st, and you want to basically fly home on Tuesday. That doesn't give us a lot of time in California. It's going to be very expensive. And he said, yeah, I'd like to do that. Um, and he wasn't a kid that asked for very much. So I went along with it. It cost way more money than I would have liked to have spent. But it's the best money I ever spent because that was our last picture together as a family. Tim was a part of his girlfriend's family. He was the big brother to Caitlin's younger brother and sister. And he was there for them if they needed him or wanted him for anything. He was loved, trusted, and appreciated more than he knew. They were and are still devastated by his death. And Tim was a big guy who took on the role of protector of his friends, or of anyone who needed it. He was a great friend, brother, and boyfriend. He brought lightness to any room, making people smile and laugh. My favorite picture is the one to the right. That, to me, is pure contentment. They truly were perfect for each other. One of the reasons we're, we're talking about Tim so much um, is because Tim is just like all of you. He could be any one of you, any one of your siblings, any one of your friends. So as we go through this next part of it, think about it being you or a friend of yours or a sibling of yours. Um, we want you to feel it because hopefully when you feel it, you will make better decisions going forward. So let me set the stage um, as to what happened to Tim. On February 2nd, 2017, which was 30 days after the Rose Bowl, um, Tim received a text message telling him to report to his fraternity house by 9.30 p.m. wearing khakis and a blazer. He was told not to be late and that they were going to get him fucked up. Once he got to the house, he and the other pledges were greeted with a small ceremony and they were handed a handle of vodka and were told that they had to finish it before moving on. Simple math would tell you that on average each pledge had about three and a half shots in a matter of minutes. After finishing the handle, they were lined up behind the door, and one by one, they were allowed through the door where they encountered a drinking obstacle course with several stations, which included beer shotguns, wine bag stations, vo more vodka, a beer pong challenge, and, and other, other drinks along the way. Um, they were being screamed at and pushed, and, and more beer chugging uh, was happening as that was going on. And then the, the obstacle course was followed by a so-called celebratory event in, in the basement of the fraternity house where the pledges were handled more vodka, handed more vodka, I should say, more wine bags and beers to drink. Um, you know, it was, it's interesting in that it was captured on video. It's the only time, as far as we know in history, that the, the a whole situation like this was, was captured on video, which is why it's played out nationally so much. Um, but anyway, so after all this... Uh, after all this happened, somebody brought Tim upstairs because they knew he was noticeably drunk. Um, and it was about 11 o'clock at night. Uh, problem is they left him alone. Um, so he actually tried to leave the house and, and get out the front door, but he couldn't figure out how to open the door to the fraternity house. Um, so then he went back towards the uh, basement of the house, and he fell down the stairs. And, uh, he was unconscious at the bottom of the stairs. His head was, was tilted and, and um, arched against the, the bottom of the stairs. Four guys were seen carrying him up. His body was limp, and they threw him on a couch. Throughout that night, <clears throat> they, uh, they kind of threw beer on him. They slapped him. They punched him. They threw shoes at him, um, I guess figuring they would get him up. There were some people that knew he was seriously hurt, and they tried to get the others to call for help. Uh, but no one called for help. Um, in fact, uh, one person was essentially assaulted and thrown against the wall. I'm sure it's not news. You probably have heard about it. Um, and was told he better, he better not uh, call for help and he better just shut up. So long story short, nobody called for help for Tim. Um, he vomited and, and, and uh, was, was having convulsions um, throughout you know, a good portion of the night. And then finally, most of the, uh, well, actually everybody else went to bed or left the house. 
and they left him downstairs by himself to, I guess, sleep it off. Um, during the course of the night, Tim came in and out of coherency. Uh, he walked around the house. He fell down a bunch more times. Um, and then he went back to the basement steps, and that's really the last time anything was seen of him in the video. He was found the next morning um, unconscious. Uh, his body was stiff, um, fetal position, uh, very difficult to move his, his, open his fingers or his hands, move his limbs. Um, they carried him back upstairs. And for about 45 minutes, they talked about, all right, well, what do we do now? This is clearly a problem. Um, I think one of the quotes is, uh, he looked fucking dead. Um, but they waited 45 more minutes. Um, finally, they called 911. Uh, 911 came. They never told 911 about the fall, um, about any of the injuries. Uh, they just said he had, he had been drinking a bit. Uh, so then he was taken to the hospital, and uh, from there I will let my wife take it. So who here has a brother or sister close in age to you? close enough to be in college at the same time. If not, consider your best friend and consider that you're both going to the same college. Now, close your eyes and imagine that your brother's pledging a fraternity and it started last night. You get a call from your brother's roommate saying he didn't come home last night and that's not like him. He always comes home. You decide something's wrong and call the hospital to see if he's there. They say, yes, there's been an accident. Come right away. You rush to the hospital and see your brother on life support, neck brace, bruises and blood on his body and head, eyes half open. The doctor tells you it's bad, that he has a subdural hematoma, which is bleeding in his brain. His spleen is ruptured. He has a punctured lung, and he needs a blood transfusion because, as it turns out, 80% of his body's blood is in his abdomen. You have to call your mom to tell her that the doctor's going to call but that your parents need to come right now. You tell her what little information you know, that it was the first night of pledging <clears throat> and that he fell down the stairs. They need to medevac him to a trauma hospital one and a half hours away, Hershey Medical Center, you, for, for neurosurgery immediately. You talk to him even though he's unconscious. You tell him to hang in there, that you are proud of him and that you love him. A tear rolls down his cheek you think he heard you, and then they take him away. Now, picture your mom and dad getting that phone call, as well as the call from the ER doctor. The doctor says he's a very sick boy, but they don't understand what he's hinting at, that their son is dying. It doesn't click. Both mom and dad have to drive 45 excruciating minutes to get home, to pack bags, and then drive over two hours to get to the hospital where he'll be having surgery. Your dad says, this better not have anything to do with that fraternity. And your mom tells him, it was the first night of pledging. They call the police to find out what's happened. There's not a lot of information, but they say he fell down the steps once, maybe twice. They get to the hospital and feel sick when they see the helicopter still sitting outside. They rush in and have to wait in the surgical waiting room. Finally, someone comes to take them to surgical ICU to meet with the surgeons. It turns out this man is a chaplain, but they don't know why a chaplain was sent to get them. It doesn't click. In a small room, a surgeon and a nurse tell them that their son's brain injury is non-recoverable. They feel the world stop. Another surgeon comes in and says that once the skull was removed to release the pressure on the brain, the brain kept swelling outside of the skull and that this is considered brain death. They try to comprehend what's happening. He's brain dead? How can this be? He's still on life support. Is there any hope for recovery? No. They have tests to prove brain death, but they can't be done because of his other injuries. You get a ride with your roommate to the hospital and find out how bad it is from your parents. You try to be the strong one. His girlfriend comes with her dad. They have to tell her that the boy she loves is brain dead. You all cry together. Then. You finally get to see him. The only skin showing is his shoulders. He's covered with blankets to keep him warm, but his body won't warm up. His head is covered with a white gauze stocking cap to cover the bandages from having his skull removed to release the pressure on the brain from the bleeding. 
and he's got bruises and swelling on his face. He's on a ventilator, there are IVs everywhere, and machines monitoring his oxygen level and body temperature. They need to put chest tubes in his lungs because his oxygen level is dropping. They think he aspirated on vomit. The doctors and nurses tell you that they are doing everything they can, but that it's just a matter of time. He's going to go into cardiac arrest. The organ donor person is talking to you about donating his kidneys, the only undamaged organs. Now, you have to decide, all of you, whether to resuscitate him when he goes into cardiac arrest, potentially breaking ribs in his already battered body, only to know that he will go into cardiac arrest again. Or do you let him go into cardiac arrest and die so they can take him into an operating room to harvest his organs? Or do you turn the machines off now in an operating room and let him go so they can harvest his organs immediately? You, your parents, his girlfriend and her dad decide to turn the machines off, but he codes before you can tell the doctors. And they resuscitate him as you watch from the hallway. A nurse pulls your mom forward and tells her to kiss her baby goodbye. He goes into cardiac arrest again, and you all let him go. You and the 10 medical personnel in the room who look at you with sad eyes. And there it is, he's dead. It's 1.23 a.m. A day and a half ago, he was alive and happy. How did this happen? How did we get here? What happened to that <clears throat> fraternity house? This doesn't make sense. He was a good kid. He wasn't a risk taker. He wasn't a drinker. He was a good student. He had a longtime girlfriend who he was planning a future with. He had great friends and roommates. He had plans for his future at school and for his career. What happened? He was an amazing person who was hazed with alcohol and then ignored, tortured, and left to die because the fraternity didn't want to get in trouble. Think about this being your loss. Think about this being your pain. Think about having a funeral, having your brother cremate it, and having to watch your mom put his urn in a niche at the mausoleum. Think about you losing your best friend, your only sibling. Why? Because he was hazed with alcohol. Everyone's lives are forever altered, and there will always be this hole in your heart because he was hazed, got seriously hurt, and no one was willing to do the right thing and call for help because they didn't want to get in trouble. <clears throat> so a couple of things I, I want to mention. Um, I know I mentioned uh, the, the passing of the, the vodka handle um, and three and a half drinks in just a matter of minutes. Um, throughout the night, it, it was determined that uh, on camera, Tim had about 18 drinks in less than 90 minutes. Uh, you'll see in a bit that that is just out of control levels of drinking. And again, we talk about it because what happened that night is a direct result of alcohol. Um, the other point I want to make is, you know, we talk about fraternity and we talk about hazing, but we are not anti-Greek life. Um, we just, again, we go around the country talking to fraternities and sororities to try to make things safer. Um, so for those of you that are in Greek life, this is not an attack on you.